The film starts with people trying hard to smash an asteroid heading towards Earth. They succeed, saving the world from destruction. But there's a twist. Their actions accidentally unleash a chemical that turns cold-blooded animals into giant monsters, wiping out many humans. When scary monsters invade Fairfield, Joel Dawson gets separated from his girlfriend, Amy. He promises to find her once things calm down. Sadly, Joel loses his parents to one of the monsters soon after Amy leaves. In just a year, almost all humans are gone, leaving only 5% alive. The survivors hide in secret spots like underground bunkers to stay safe. It's been seven years since the monsters came. Joel lives in an underground shelter called a colony. Some survivors there become couples and kiss a lot. Since the shelter is small, Joel often overhears their conversations. He feels lonelier over time and misses Amy, wishing she were with him. In Joel's shelter, everyone shares the job of finding food and stuff they need. Joel isn't brave, so his job is cooking and looking after Jerdy, a cow. But he also practices archery in his free time. Even though he's practiced a lot, he's never good at it because he can't aim right. One day, a huge ant got into the shelter, so everyone split up to fight it, Joel included. While searching for a survivor named Connor who was missing, Joel found him killed by the ant. Scared, Joel tried to shoot the ant, but closed his eyes. Then, Ray shot and killed the ant. After that event, Joel drew a picture of the ant monster in his notebook. Drawing is his hobby, and he likes to draw every monster he encounters. Joel's drawings are detailed and good. He often explains the monsters in detail. While playing with the radio, Joel heard Amy's voice. He was thrilled to hear from her after so long. When he found out where Amy was staying, which was 85 miles away from his bunker, he decided to visit her. Everyone tried to stop Joel from leaving because they were concerned about him. They believed Joel wouldn't survive long outside due to his lack of experience. However, Joel was determined to keep his promise to Amy, made seven years ago. After bidding farewell to everyone, Joel prepared for his journey, carrying only a bow and a mat made by Karen. After walking through the valley from the bunker, Joel reached the edge of a deserted town. He casually picked up a frisbee and went into a house to look for food. Unfortunately, the fridge was empty and there was a monster inside growling at him. Joel quickly ran to the yard, but there, he saw something odd in the small pond. Bubbles appeared on the surface, and suddenly, a huge frog monster emerged and attacked Joel, knocking him out. Shortly after, Joel woke up and was surprised to see a dog trying to alert him about the toad monster. Joel quickly got up and ran away, but the toad monster caught his leg with its tongue. Suddenly, the dog bit the monster's tongue freeing Joel. Following the dog's lead, Joel escaped from the frog monster's attack. The dog took Joel to a bus where it had been staying with its owner. The dog's name was Boy, but Joel couldn't find the owner, so they might be dead. Even though Boy helped Joel, he became upset when Joel touched his master's red dress without asking. The next day, Joel said goodbye to Boy and asked for his owner's lipstick as a gift for Amy. Instead, Boy followed Joel, carrying the red dress. At last, Joel brings Boy along on his journey to Amy's colony. Joel wants Boy to act like his pet, but Boy isn't interested, especially with the constant danger of monster attacks. When Joel goes to pick berries to eat, Boy tries to warn him because the berries are poisonous. While Joel was reading his book, he accidentally fell into a hole, which turned out to be a nest of sand gobbler worm monsters. He nearly became their meal, but luckily, two survivors named Clyde Dutton and Minnow rescued him by throwing a rope. They asked Joel where he was headed, and he said he was going west. It turned out Clyde and Minnow were heading north to the mountains, so their destinations were different. Clyde and Minnow went towards the North Mountains because they thought fewer monsters could handle the cold and high ground there. They offered to travel with Joel until they reached a certain point. On the journey, 
they taught Joel some survival skills. Minnow patiently showed Joel the right way to shoot arrows, so Joel wouldn't miss his target anymore. Minnow explained that Joel had to be confident in his shot to avoid missing. Joel's archery improved a lot with Minnow's help, becoming even more accurate. While they trained, Clyde mentioned that a big monster had been tracking Joel since he fell into the sand gobbler's nest. However, these giant monsters moved slowly, so it would take them a while to catch up. As they walked through the forest, Clyde suddenly signaled Joel to stop and stay quiet. Behind Joel, they spotted a huge snail monster. Clyde came up with a plan to attach Joel's clothes to the snail monster's shell. This tricked the monster following Joel's scent, making it lose track of him. Once the snail monster moved away, Minnow explained that these creatures, often called boulder snails, were actually friendly. Not all monsters are bad. You can tell by looking at their eyes, Minnow said. As time passed, Joel's archery improved, making Minnow very proud of him. Their bond grew stronger, like brothers. Before parting ways, Clyde shared some crucial information for Joel's journey. He mentioned the wild pucus plant, which can cure any poison, and warned about the queen sand gobbler's attack, which is deadlier than regular sand gobblers. They reached the point where they had to separate. Joel feels thankful to Clyde and Minnow for rescuing him and teaching him vital survival skills. Minnow appears sad because she sees Joel as a brother and hates to say goodbye. To cheer her up, Joel gives her the lipstick he found. Before they leave, Clyde gives Joel a grenade for emergencies. As Joel was walking through the dark forest, he heard a strange noise from the ground. It was a giant centipede monster attacking him and getting ready to attack Boy. Remembering how monsters had killed his parents, Joel quickly got up to save Boy. He didn't want to lose anyone else to monsters. Joel grabbed his gun and aimed it at the centipede's head, managing to shoot it down. Joel and Boy found safety in an old motel. Inside, Joel came across a robot named Mavis, which had very little power left. Joel used the last of Mavis's power to contact Amy and tell her where he was. Before Mavis's battery died, it showed Joel some pictures of his parents when they were alive. Seeing his mother in the photos brought Joel some comfort. Then, Mavis played calming music, and Joel relaxed while watching a giant jellyfish floating in the air, glowing with beautiful light. The following day, Joel and Boy encountered the Queen Sand Gobbler, and had to run and hide behind a tree to escape. When the Queen left, Boy barked because his master's red dress fell into the river, attracting the giant monster's attention again. The Sand Gobbler Queen attacked once more, but Joel used a grenade from Clyde to kill it just in time, though he fell into the river in the process. After swooning across the river, Joel found himself covered in poisonous leeches clinging to his body. He managed to remove them all, but got angry at Boy for putting them in danger. Upset, Boy ran away. Joel carried on through the forest, but the leech poison started affecting him. He became paler and weaker until he collapsed. Just before passing out, Joel spotted the antidote pucus plant and ate it. After waking up and feeling a bit better, Joel attempted to continue, but found his body still weak. So he rested against a tree trunk. Joel began to imagine seeing Amy in front of him and almost kissed her, but he soon passed out again. When Joel woke up, he found himself at Amy's colony. What he saw before passing out wasn't a hallucination. It was Amy who had come to rescue him. Her colony was located by the sea. However, most of the survivors there were elderly, relying on Amy for protection. Amy informs Joel that they're all ready to leave for a safer location. They've been invited by a group of survivors who own a cruise ship. Joel meets Donna, Rocco, and their captain, nicknamed Cap, on the ship. At a party before departure, Joel expresses his love for Amy once more, but she doesn't feel the same way. Amy expressed happiness at seeing Joel again, but she admitted that her feelings for him had faded over time. She's now in love with someone else and still mourns their loss deeply. Later, 
Joel and Amy joined the party and listened to Cap's heroic tales of fighting and defeating many monsters. After the party, Joel tries to use the radio to tell this colony that he's reached Amy's colony safely. But there's no connection, and nobody answers. While waiting for a response, Joel looks at the map Karen gave him. As he flips it over, he discovers a message written by his colony members. Reading their messages touches Joel deeply. He realizes that the people who think and care about him the most are the members of his own colony. Finally, Joel managed to connect to the radio channel and heard Ray's voice. Ray and the others were thrilled that Joel was alive and had found Amy. However, they sounded worried because the situation in Joel's colony wasn't good. They sounded panicked. Ray mentioned that the bunker wasn't safe, so they had to end the radio connection. Joel decided to hurry back to his colony. A survivor offers Joel a plate of berries, claiming they're a gift from Cap. But Joel realizes they're poisonous. Suspecting Cap's ill intentions, Joel rushes to warn Amy, but she's drunk and ignores him. Suddenly, Donna attacks Joel, knocking him out. When Joel, Amy, and the others wake up, they find themselves tied up on the beach. Cap reveals his plan to steal the food supplies from Amy's colony. It turns out Cap and his gang are criminals who raid other colonies for food. Worse, their yacht is being pulled by a giant crab monster controlled by electric chains. Cap commanded the crab monster to electrocute the colony members, but Joel and Amy managed to break free. Amy fought Donna and Rocco, while Joel defended the colony from the crab monster. Using an iron spear, Joel tried to stab the monster, managing to topple it over, but Cap shocked him, knocking him down. When the monster attacked Joel again, Boy arrived to help. Cap ordered Donna to shoot Boy, but Amy intervened. Angrily, Cap hit Amy until she passed out. Cap and his men hurried onto the cruise ship, leaving Joel struggling against the crab monster. Boy tried to wake Amy to help Joel, who was trapped by the monster's claws. Amy quickly woke up and tossed a weapon to Joel to fight the crab monster. Joel grabbed his gun and had a chance to kill the monster. However, he realized the crab wasn't evil when he looked into its eyes. Seeing the monster in pain from the electric chains, Joel decided to free it by shooting the chains. In return, the crab attacked Cap and his crew, sinking their yacht. Joel suggested that Amy and her colony move to the North Mountains. They shared a romantic goodbye kiss before Joel headed back to his colony. Upon his return, he was warmly welcomed. Joel and his colony decided to go to the mountains. He encouraged other colonies not to fear the surface, as he had survived for seven days. If a coward like him could do it, others could too. As they journeyed north, Clyde and Minnow wondered if Joel would make it. So the moral of the story is always double-check your berries especially if they're from a dubious source like Cap. And remember, even giant crab monsters might just need a little kindness. Just look them in the eyes.